Yes, when you first sent your CD, when you finally got it done and you and Jacob said it, we just received it and, oh, it just, it was like us getting a Christmas present. <laughs> it lasts, lasts for years. <laughs> it just goes on and on. Yeah, it's beautiful. I was thinking today, we'll see how the day unfolds, but we might even have some, uh, yeah, some music meditations in here. Just, it helps with transfer the training and with all these deep experiences everyone's going into and and yeah, such a we're just so grateful for Jacob and Maria's music. It's just been such a gift to our whole community and I know to the world. And is the <coughs> CD available? Can people get that online or how is it do you have to it can still be found on something called CD Baby dot com. Okay. CD Baby dot com. Yeah, There's no songs on them. I have to cover though, but not so. Okay. <laughs> That's good, just to know. That's good. I hope people can enjoy it as much as we have. And then I hope it keeps getting reprinted. I think that's what happens with certain books and CDs. They just have such an impact that they just, by popular demand, they get reprinted. And it's, it's mystical, so it's not like, we're not talking like mainstream music, but it's very devotional and very, very mystical and just, yeah, it's touched all of us in our community. People know that I start singing a few lines and people in the van start singing along, they know all the lyrics. <laughs> you know, so it's been good. Okay, well, it was a very, very deep movie last night. It was kind of a pull the rug out from under your st stalemates in your mind, any kind of uh, you know, where you can get into these kind of stuck points. And it can even be, with a spiritual practice sometimes, it can be thinking you know something about your practice and the world and the Course and everything, and then you get into these deep experiences that we, it's really taking you towards mysticism and it's good. It's just a good, um, sometimes it's just a good jump start for authenticity and transparency in your spiritual journey. Because, yeah, in terms of mysticism, there's just, it's, over the centuries there's only been handfuls of people that really seem to be symbols of diving down into that deep state of transcendence. And, and those oftentimes get called mystics and saints. And they write about their dark nights and they write about the intensity and the resistance there is to opening up to that depth because this whole world, this whole cosmos of linear time was made to guard against that experience. And when you start to tap on the door, the ego is, I guess when, when you feel that much love, the ego not only goes from suspicious to vicious, but it goes into a tirade, <laughs> actually. Tirade, what's that? Um, Protein. Yeah. It's like a, a protest of rage. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's right up there with viciousness. <laughs> and, um, and I think that's the key on the spiritual journey is you have to have such allowance and permission to let yourself go through that. To let whatever the dark storms are, the thunderclouds form, the, let the storms come and let them pass. You know, it's not, you don't really have to do anything to those feelings, you just have to let them move through. And um, in my life, it, in the parable of David, it was more going off to, to the woods, having a little uh, travel trailer in the woods, or a little a tiny house <laughs> out in the middle of nowhere seemingly. Um, because there was so much rage that had to come up and so much darkness that you know, it just felt like it was better to do it um, out away in nature than it was around people. Because uh, people can tend to interpret that uh, you're losing your mind. <laughs> you're really finding it, but <laughs> everything in this world is upside down and backwards, so it appears that you could be losing your sanity. You're actually coming inward to sanity. And the ego interprets that as insane because the ego doesn't want you in there. There's even a subsection in the Course called the fear to look within. 
And it's really a, a title that, even that subtitle, subsection explains how, how the ego doesn't want you to go there uh, because it's, it's, so, it's fear of loss. It's fear of loss of the world, loss of self, loss of personality, loss of everything that it holds dear. And underneath all that, the tirades, the protest, and the, the viciousness is basically the belief in sacrifice. It's kind of funny for me working with the Course for a quarter of a century because I go to Course groups and people are, I hear people in the Course groups talking about, oh, those fundamentalist Christians. <laughs> those fundamentalist Christians, as if the Course students are above <laughs> the fundamentalist Christians. Like, we are more metaphysically advanced, we found the truth, we've got it, they don't. It's the same, we've got it, they don't game and everything, and, and yet, if you've got anything on fundamentalist Christians, anything stirring in your mind, it's just reflecting that there's still an investment in the belief in sacrifice. Because that's oftentimes what's projected off onto fundamentalist Christians is they believe that Jesus died for our sins and paid the ultimate price, paid the ransom, sacrificial blood of the Lamb and all this stuff, and people just are like, ugh. They don't even like to be around it. But the reason they don't like to be around it is because they still believe in it. They actually still believe that too. And so, even new thought teachings, you know, Christian science, religious science, um, yeah, Rudolf Steiner, I put him right in all the great new, new thought thinkers. Uh, there's just a whole bunch of them, Ernest Holmes and so on and so forth. But when people have difficulties around sickness or around <coughs> relationships or whatever, it's not really about those things, it's really the belief in sacrifice is still rooted down there. And that's what has to be seen as impossible. Because as long as you believe it's a sacrifice to give up this world, or it's a sacrifice to give up the good things of this world, you still believe in sacrifice, no doubt. And, and you'll hit that deep emotion and those deep rage feelings, just like everyone does when they get down deep enough. They hit the, the core root. So, let's just talk a little bit about sacrifice, because it's not the, the problem of the fundamentalist Christians. Uh, they've got no problem at all. <laughs> not at all. They're just projections of a belief. It's this idea that you can make something other than God, you can invent, you can make fiction, you can uh, kind of come up with this substitute for divine love and oneness, and then that's the first step, which is part of the belief that you can create yourself. And then once you seem to have established this world of time and space, um, Basically, the, the ego will be on a spiritual temper tantrum wanting God to grant reality to the illusion. And so basically, all this rage that's been playing out over millennium, um, it's acted out in all kinds of ways in terms of wars and pestilence and, and suicides and group suicides and all kinds of things, that's just all the ego's temper tantrum at God. So when you have anger that comes up, and you have rage that comes up and everything, even though it's startling, and you may want to shut it down or cover it over or push it away, it's actually, it's actually not your anger. It's not yours. It's not ours. It's the ego's. The ego is raging at God saying, grant me my dream world, grant reality to illusions, grant eternity to time, come on. It's almost like a, a waiting game, like the ego is waiting God out. Like, you know how kids do sometimes with parents, you know, just wait it out, wait it out. I'm going to get what I want. <laughs> just going to wait, play the waiting game. They'll give in at some point. I'll wear him down. I'll wear him down over time. Ego's trying to wear God down over time and hope 
that it throws enough tantrums, why do kids throw temper tantrums? Because they want something. <laughs> That's good. Let's get it. all the mothers and fathers to, to explain what uh, <laughs> they they can do. <laughs> Maria's going, yeah, yeah, let's hear those words. <laughs> the translations are filtering in. Oh, yeah. <laughs> do they have temper tantrums in Denmark? Oh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Or is everyone well behaved? <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, it's the ego's rage at God. The ego's wanting to have some recognition. You know, it wants to be recognized. It wants its world of, of linear time and space to be recognized. But it's, it's always important to remember that those aren't your emotions. Those aren't our emotions. Because we aren't the ego. But when we identify with the ego, we experience its emotions. You see what the forgiveness is all about, is disidentifying from the ego. Because as long as you identify with it, it's almost like in that, that movie, um, um, the Avatar, where, where they, they go into those like, like crypts almost like, and then they take on the avatar bodies and then they can move with these bigger avatar bodies on this avatar planet and so on and so forth. And so like if you go in, if you give your mind over to the ego, then you experience its emotions. And, and the best thing to do, of course the only thing to do is, is detach from the ego and become completely disidentified from the ego. So, in A Course in Miracles, Jesus says, you made the ego by believing in it, and you can dispel it by withdrawing your belief from it. And that's what the point of the movie was last night, was um, starting to get a clue that there's something amiss, which our main characters, Ewan McGregor and Scarlett Johansson, that they, they started to see something was amiss in their world, something wasn't quite right, and then they discovered that their lives and their world and everything that they thought was true was not actually the way things were, and then they seemed to get out of that environment only to meet their sponsors, which was a pretty rocky experience <laughs> as well. <laughs> and then realizing they weren't going to find any release from their sponsors, which was just the, the ones that, that were paying for their artificial lives, um, they actually had to go back into the core of the beast and dismantle the whole thing. Just shut it down. That's what he said. I think if I could get in there, I can shut it down. It's, it's really like, the, remember the Star Wars, the original Star Wars series with Luke Skywalker? And Darth Vader, Princess Leia. I actually got to meet Princess Leia. She lives in uh, Finland. <laughs> I got to meet the real Princess Leia when I was over there. She was in the might and the glory of God. The Princess Leia of, of George Lucas was nothing. The one in Finland. I would do gatherings and she would look out among the audience and put her hand up. When, and just kind of stare at the people there in Finland like, come forth now with your questions, don't be shy. <laughs> and if they would, wouldn't have anything for like 30 seconds, she would then look somebody right in the eye and say, now, you speak on this. <laughs> They'd be like, okay. <laughs> I should always travel with Princess Leia. That's what I'm, I'm coming to see. I, I, I think it could speed up the gathering, to speed up the awakening. If I, if I just had the, the princess there with her arm going up and everyone hushing in reverence, trembling a little, but she stares at all of them and then draws it out of them. It was quite an experience. But I, Star Wars, if you'll remember, there's the one in Star Wars where Luke has to go into the Death Star. Because Darth Vader always had this, you know, this kind of sound and was, we always masked and it was always black and kind of a spooky character, but 
But that he lived in the Death Star. It, the Death Star was massive. Because we're talking about, like, it's a whole system. It's not one person. There's not a my ego or one character, one evil character. It's, it's a whole system. And this Death Star was massive. And Luke had to go inside the Death Star and then get in there to this massive Death Star. And then he had to find a way to get to the power source and make a direct hit on the power source to knock it out. Mm -hmm. And he got closer and closer and closer, you might remember, in that movie, and then Obi-Wan Kenobi said, use the force, Luke, use the force. Don't rely on the instrument panels. He had to literally close his eyes, and he couldn't even use all this technology, all of his, his his aircraft and his weapons and everything, he had to basically go inside to use the force to make a direct hit on the power plant of the Death Star. That's, in Course in Miracles terms, that's atonement. You're going in towards the atonement to make a direct hit on the ego. And the atonement is a direct hit. The, the atonement is that the separation never happened. Now that's going to take you into innocence. But that's all that will take you into innocence. There's not any kind of uh, secondary measures you can use. You have to have a direct hit. And you have to be 100% intuitive to, to go in there, because there, there was one problem, and that problem has already been corrected. And the Holy Spirit is that correction, so the atonement is the, the answer. So, yeah, I think today we would start in um, just taking in some of the, the reactions and the things that came up, to, you know, after the movie, during, probably during and after the movie, so we can kind of join together with the Spirit and take a closer look at that. And, um, yeah, Francis and Kirsten shared a bit about the groups, and Jason, um, if we had to summarize, some of the things that came up into like a, a theme, what would be a good starting point? I think awareness uh, of a meaninglessness is coming up into awareness. And awareness that of the split in the mind, that yes, there's awareness of almost a feeling of death, like that life and living in this world is, is just not really it. And almost thinking of death as the body as a way out, but knowing that's not really the way out. Um, so just awareness of the meaninglessness, uh, but also awareness of the desire to wake up and the desire to still hold on to the world. Even though there's a meaninglessness <coughs> with it, uh, still feeling a value with it, and then going, okay, what do I do with that? Um, and then we explored a little bit of how, you know, truly life is awareness of the spirit and uh, being sourced, and then how the spirit will use the world, use backdrops in the world to support commitment because seeing that split is being aware of the lack of commitment. I'm not fully committed to awakening because I still want the world, but I'm, I'm not committed to the world either. And even something like a, a diet or something or a relationship, seeing that there's still a little bit of lack of commitment in everything. This feeling of the lack of commitment is part of the meaninglessness, not feeling a whole going for it. So then there was a little bit of exploration um, of how the spirit can use backdrops in the world, like a relationship commitment or something for mind training, a dietary commitment, um, to loosen the mind from identification with the ego and deepen the commitment and using it for seeing the beliefs in the mind, like if it was around food. Um, seeing the belief in healthy food versus unhealthy food and still wanting to maintain the body with food, um, but using it in a conscious way. And then just seeing the, the mind slip into, oh good, I could still hold on to the world. 
an organic food and wanting to look after the world? And can I bring the course into it? So just seeing how quickly the mind would want to then slip into, oh, so that could I then still be invested in the world and would that be okay uh, as part of the spiritual journey? And then coming back to seeing, oh no, it is a decision for awakening that I have to make now to go for it. And then trust that somehow the spirit will use the willingness to keep loosening the mind from identification. And just allowing the meaninglessness, not trying to, wanting, trying to skip too quickly into feeling okay. So just allow, really allow. You could almost feel a, just a gratitude for the awareness. Like it's a good step. Yeah, um, in our group, I think the experience is more like an experience instead of the specific. I think it's, you know, as an extension of the movie last night, something is really in the move and there is a deep appreciation of the mind being something that has been rewired so to speak but yet at the same time there's another force call it fear or call it rage or whatever it is it's just i think it's just a crack openness really that's that's what it is and it's more energetic and it's more like a feeling and the thoughts can be expressed at the at the at the surface level about different specifics, but that's what we're allowing them to come up and flash up that I can see is just like this energy, something is really shifting in the mind and there is a, a cracked openness and it can feel a little strange or uncomfortable, but it's a shared feeling of some kind of release and some kind of shift that's going on. That's good. So it's, I think it gives us a context for this idea that, that, that what A Course in Miracles and what true spirituality is offering us is a retranslation of the world. I think, I think that's a very helpful word, retranslation. Because um, when we say, like in Lesson 128, the world I see holds nothing that I want, and then in Lesson 129, beyond this world is a world I want. Really that's what's coming in through the glory and through the grace of God, is a retranslated world. And retranslation doesn't really imply sacrifice, it's, it's just, it's a shift from a linear perception into what we call sometimes a vertical perception or a simultaneous perception, which is closer to eternity. We could say the vertical is, is the coming into the now and it's coming into a unified perception of the world, true perception, the happy dream, the real world. It's, Jesus calls it by different names, but it's a retranslation. So let's talk a little bit about that retranslation. I talked yesterday about going from an upside down world to a right side up world or wrong mindedness to right mindedness, but What's important about this retranslation, <coughs> one thing you can remember that will give you, uh, it will comfort your heart during the switch, the turnaround, is that the Holy Spirit can use everything that the ego made. So even though this linear world was made as an attack upon God, a place where God can enter not, even though it was made as a defense, against love, even though it was made in hate, we're told by Jesus the world was made in hate, the body was made in hate, we can retranslate, we can, with the Holy Spirit everything can be retranslated, which means that during the retranslation everything can be used by the Holy Spirit. Everything, without exception, everything that the ego made can be used. Now, if we had to summarize everything that the ego made, uh, we could say the ego made time. Because there's no time in eternity. So that's the, that's the shortest word I think we can come up with as far as a metaphor. 
the ego made time, and the Holy Spirit uses time to undo the belief in time. So, it's not that the Holy Spirit will use anything that the ego made to keep what the ego made. It will use what the ego made to undo the belief in what the ego made. The Holy Spirit uses time to show that there is no time. The Holy Spirit uses body issues to show that there are no body issues. The Holy Spirit uses cravings to show that there are no cravings. The Holy Spirit uses attractions to show that there are no attractions. The Holy Spirit will use the law of attraction to ultimately show you that there is no such thing as attraction. So that's, that's what it's about. Kim. How do How do the Holy Spirit use attraction in order to to show that there is no attraction? What's the question that came up here? Well, we can give you a lot of examples from our experiences in our parables, and I would say that it's almost like the things that the ego was attracted to through the symbolic character of David. It was like. Um, it was like, nothing will be ripped away from you. Um, it was this feeling like, I call them whims. I had to come up with a name. It wasn't in the course, but I call them like whims. Like little wishes of things that still were preferred and attracted in the world. Um, because if the belief in sacrifice is still down there in the root, and you start to go through this journey where you start to perceive that, that things are literally being taken away from you and that the world is literally, the world as you thought you knew it starts to dismantle and everything. If it goes too rapid or the mind interprets that it's losing something, that it's actually losing something, then it induces like a panic, a, a panic and a fear. And the panic never is helpful. You know, the panics, like the, this, the ego is screaming, stop this, you know, you stop this now, this is terrible, this whole direction is terrible. So, you know, we have lots and lots of examples about how seemingly in our parable of our travels and doing all these workshops and seminars and retreats and everything, how uh, things would come in, music, um, um, you know, with Kirsten in the early years, she came from New Zealand, and so water was coming in. Um, what are some of the things? Water, swimming pools, swimming pools ice cream, ice cream, <laughs> the big one. In surprising ways, that sh they they show you that it's the spirit providing it. So it was it was symbolic of. Uh, so when I traveled with David, when I first. <coughs> Um, everywhere we went, there was a swimming pool or a beach. We were invited to places near the ocean. And, and every time we would get there, I would dive into the water and just... Because my mind, I was going through such a transformation um, with dealing with a lot of ego thoughts and intensity. And as soon as I would dive into the water, I would feel this cool silence. And I'd feel so relieved <laughs> and loved by the Spirit. And, and David said after a few weeks, he's like, wow, I've never seen so much water in so many swimming pools. And I could just feel it was the Spirit's just love. You know. And I also loved ice cream. And so everywhere we went, it was like ice cream would show up over and over and over again. And I could feel it was just like Jesus saying, I love you, you're doing so well. Here, have an ice cream. <laughs> it felt very sweet. Very sweet, and showing me now it's not a sacrifice. <coughs> so I wasn't going out there trying to get the ice creams or make the swimming pools happen, but they were just provided. Um, Spontaneously too, where we, you know, we absolutely were not seeking after ice cream, or I wasn't, had no thought in my mind of water, but it was just showing up. There was a time, I think I remember when we went to, we were in some town in Wisconsin, and, um, Something was stirring for Kirsten. We went out for a walk, something was stirring, and she, she just was 
daughter just felt, she just felt real funky that day and, you know, just disoriented, a bit disturbed, really disturbed. And we're walking along and, and so I just kind of just had the prayer going in my mind, you know, is, is there anything, Jesus, that, you know, would be helpful here? And Jesus said, take her immediately to Dairy Queen. Uh, which is a, an ice cream place that has all these different kinds of, you know, jimmies and chocolates and all, all kinds of things. It just specializes in a <coughs> massive amount of ice cream, ice cream treats. And so I took her hand, we walked straight over there. We walked into the Dairy Queen and nobody was there. But the guy who was behind the counter with his little red Dairy Queen hat on, he was all excited. It looked like he was like he's new in his job and he's waiting for a customer to come in. And he was all he walked in the door. He was all puffed up, like a bird gets puffed up. He was so excited. Can I help you? He was like his whole life depended on serving us some ice cream. And I went up to him and I said, "Listen, she's from New Zealand. She's never had anything from Dairy Queen ever before." He said, <laughs> really? <laughs> like, wow. So then he's like super puffed up now. I said, give her the show, show her, you know. So he's like going through all the things, blizzards and all these different kinds of treats. It took him a few minutes to actually go through because he was so grateful that he had the opportunity to. And then, of course, she ordered what she ordered and he fixed it with all the care and love. We were the only two people in there. And Kirsten's attitude and everything just turned into the miracle through the ice cream. You know, it's it's this is what we mean by it's miracles are involuntary and and you don't know what's most helpful. You really don't know what's most helpful. But if you're in that place of prayer, that's an example of how the spirit can use a symbol that's really attractive. Ice cream was very attractive, and and so it, that's happens not just once or twice, but as I've traveled, you know, if down in Colombia or South America, they would say, do you, do you like, I learned the, the name actually, I don't know many Spanish words, but I learned halados, because that's ice cream. And as soon as I say halados, they say, do you like halados? And I say, si. Sí. And then, oh my gosh, you know, it would be as, all these ice cream encounters that would come because people have all this love in their heart and they want to express it in some way and that's an inroads for them. So this is an example of how how the Holy Spirit uses ego preferences as part of the plan of extending to have this deep connection happen and without reinforcing reinforcing the preference. You know, it was the key thing was in our experiences we were never thinking about, we were not trying to, like the secret, you know, to manifest it, to hold it in mind, to think of it, you know, to make it happen, whatever. There was none of that going on at all. It just was given as part of the backdrop. It's kind of a way from the Spirit, almost like giving you a kiss, saying, thank you so much for your willingness to open up. And so that's, that is the how. It, and it just happens over and over and over and over. You, you don't have any conscious awareness of it, you're delighted, but it's almost like being pleasantly surprised every single time that you get a symbol like that, because you didn't do anything to make it happen. You didn't pray for it. Yeah, yeah I was happy before I even had the first spoonful of ice cream. <laughs> it was just the love, you could feel the love behind it. And, uh, yeah, and they really get used. Um, we were going on a road trip one time, and uh, Jason and Jenny and I, and we started driving up the freeway and I just kept having this strong feeling to stop and get a cappuccino. And I was like, that's got to be the ego. We're just getting going. We just stopped and got gas at the gas station and we were on the road. And I was like, no, that's the ego. That's the ego. Don't, can't even say it. How embarrassing. I'm supposed to be enlightened and I'm hearing stop and buy a cappuccino. <laughs> so I didn't share the thought. So we drove up the road for like an hour and a half and then uh, I still kept hearing stop, stop and I'd notice these coffee shops right along the highway. And then after an hour and a half we realised we needed a map 
And so we stopped and went into the store and Jason went to grab his wallet and he left his wallet back at the gas station. And that prompt to stop and get a cappuccino, which came two minutes after we got in the car, was the spirit's communication through an ego preference saying stop, get a cappuccino, and then we would have noticed immediately. So I loved noticing that, because all of the doubt thoughts in my mind were like, oh, it's egoic, it's just, you know, deny, repress the thoughts. So I shared the thought and went, okay, spirit, I trust that even this is going to get used. I'm expecting miracles. We can't have, you know, the outcome of this being a, a mistake. So we drove back to the gas station, and uh, we started from there. We were in prayer, I hadn't been turned in. Uh, and then we went driving up the highway, just in prayer, using it all for joining, driving slowly, and then I just said, stop, pull over. And we pulled over on the side of the highway, and we looked, and Jason's wallet was there. <laughs> At the gas station, he put it on top of the car, and we'd driven out of the gas station, and it got as far as the highway, and it got blown off the car, and it was there on the side of the highway. It was run over. It had been run over by several cars, <laughs> so it was a bit beaten up, but he found the wallet. He opened it up, and there was most of the money was missing, a couple of the credit cards. So we just went into prayer. Okay, what do we do? Just felt, just walk up the side of the highway. So we walked up the side of the highway. Like, what is that? And we're like, we found in the, grass. in the grass on the side of the highway, like these $100 bill and a $50 bill. And it was a <laughs> celebration of the miracle. <laughs> it's been walking up the side of the highway. Like Easter egg hunt. Yeah, it was. Just finding everything that had been missing. Even down to the final thing that he was really worried about. He'd written, like, the pin number to a credit card on a little teeny piece of paper and had left it in his wallet. And we were walking up the road and, and he went looking and he could see in the wind blowing about like this little tiny piece of paper with the pin number in it. And so everything that we thought we'd lost was found and it was this backdrop for joining in prayer for the three of us that we really needed actually because we'd had a lot of you know healing going on between the three of us, a lot of projection, a lot of judgment. And this one experience was unified us so deeply in prayer mm. that we were set then for, for the rest of the trip. <laughs> you can see how impactful because if that happened as kind of a kind of a rare, rare, rare thing in your life, you could you could say, Well, that was a miracle. And you could just say, I'll remember that as an example. But when these kind of things start happening frequently in your consciousness, frequently in your awareness. And this is what the value of, has been for me of the road trips, many, many road trips, you know, around and around and around and around the world. It's just a backdrop to, to be very fluid, very spontaneous, and let go and let God. And even though I've had many, many different travel companions and taken many, many different trips, those um, seem like out of pattern kind of experiences. But when they happen to you frequently, and when they happen to you on a daily basis, uh, it's quite impactful on your mind. You can imagine having those kind of magical, fairy tale quality things happening more and more and more and more. As you become more consistently miracle minded, showing you that you're not in charge, showing you that you're perfectly taken care of, even if you're clueless and you forget things, you drop things, you do all the things that you would blame yourself for, and the Spirit, Jesus just uses it as another way to show you, I'm there. I'm there for you, I've got your back, you are totally provided for, and you can be, I say, clueless and cared for. And when somebody one time said, oh, that doesn't sound good at all, clueless, I said, don't forget the cared for part. You have to not know, you have to actually Cultivate not knowing what's, thinking that you know what's in your own best interest, so that the Spirit can, can show you that it's all taken care of. And an another one that's coming to mind of one of my earlier travels was when I was traveling with uh, Kathy Martin and Resta Burnham. And we had just driven from Cincinnati, our little peace house, up <coughs> through Columbus, stopped there for lunch, and, 
and then driven across over, I think, to West Virginia. They were heading for Pennsylvania and so forth. And we pulled into a gas station, and I filled up the gas, and I went in to go use the restroom. When I came back, Kathy and Rusty just had these long, sad, very serious looks on their faces. And I said, what's up? And Rusty said, I lost my purse. So this is an example of, you know, that lost my wallet, lost my purse. These kind of things in the world bring up a lot of fear for the ego, because the wallet and the purse have all this private information, credit cards and all kinds of things that you just don't want stolen, you know. Steal, my, steal the shoe off my foot, but don't steal the purse or the wallet, because those, there's so much safety and security projected onto these objects, just like money. These are the containers of the money, and the money is so exchangeable for so many things that it's an artificial value system that the ego has set up. But this is where the healing occurs, where you've got the most investment. So th they were like, they looked at me, Resta and Kathy, they said, it's gone, the purse, the purse is gone. I don't know where it is, where I left it, and I, I had it with me when we left on the trip, and I just don't know where it is, and so, so they were telling me this in the car, and I just said, well, before we get on the road, let's just pull over to the side of the gas station and pray. So we pulled over to pray, and we were there, and every, we're all praying, and then Resta, who's, it was her purse that was lost, she just burst into laughter and started laughing and laughing and laughing. I said, okay, what's happening? She said, well, Jesus just appeared to me in my mind, and he's wearing my green purse. <laughs> Jesus is wearing the purse. I said, okay, that's a very strong symbol when Jesus has a shoulder strap on and a green purse. Uh, and after you've just lost a purse with all this stuff in, she's like, I'm, I, I feel strangely very good about this. Uh, he's just, he's got a smile on his face and he's wearing a green purse on his shoulder. So I said, okay, let's just, and we prayed a little more and I said, uh, is there anything we're to do? And she said, I, no, I don't think so. I don't, no, there's nothing, nothing. I said, hmm, I'm, I'm hearing that um, you're to call your uh, husband um, and uh, I think this was a time where she was feeling a real distance from her husband getting, going through a divorce or getting ready to go through a divorce. And I, I said, I'm hearing that you should call your, your husband and tell him, you know, that you lost the purse and so on and so forth. And she said, oh, please, oh, I, I, I just hate the thought of that. Just because, <laughs> I, you know, he, he's always saying things like, I lose things, he's degrading to me, and this is, oh my God, it's the worst thing. To call him, and they're getting ready to go through a divorce, and it's just more, it's just kind of rub it in my face, and it's just, oh, it's good. And I said, well, you have so much resistance to it. I, I feel you're to call. So she finally said, okay, if this is it. So she called and told him what had happened. Turns out we, we continued on to the east coast of the United States, and um, someone had found the purse at a Wendy's restaurant that we had stopped at, picked it up, kept it, looked through all of her information and found a contact number of her house in Cincinnati, which was essential, called, spoke to her husband, and eventually the purse was returned with everything in it. It was just, it was pristinely brought back, and we, the whole trip unfolded very miraculously. It was just a symbol when Jesus was wearing the purse, like, I've got it. Go about your miracle working functions and give your joy away, shine your light. Don't even take a thought for this lost purse. Those kind of out of pattern kind of experiences are just witnesses to the mind of how safe and loved and secure you are. Not by your past learning, but by your trust and faith in following the Spirit. And there's so many, that's why we share a lot of these parables and have shared them for many, many, many years. It's because there, you need to be convinced that you don't have to just 
try to live by the laws of the world and do the best you can and give Jesus some lip service every once in a while, <laughs> or say, ooh, there's a miracle that comes every so often and you want to tell everybody about it, you know, it's, it's meant to show you that miracles are natural when they do not occur, something has gone wrong, and that you can live in a miraculous state of mind as if you're carried along. And even when you seem to make what the ego would call mistakes, the Holy Spirit doesn't see it that way at all. Those are just opportunities to convince you of the love of God. That's what a mistake, as the ego judges it, is just a, a big opportunity for the Holy Spirit to turn it around, to show you, oh, you are safe, you are cared for, you're perfectly sustained. That's what lesson number 50 is in the workbook. I am sustained by the love of God. And he talks about all the ways in that lesson that you believe you're sustained by everything but the love of God. You know, clothing, money, knowing the right people, being liked, you know, pills. He, he goes on, he's very specific in that lesson and also lesson 76, just so you have a context to understand that your past learning will never make you secure, but your faith and trust in the Holy Spirit will sustain you in every situation while you believe the situations and every circumstance. And that's, that's what the whole thing's about. You have to be convinced. So even if you have fear arising, and even if there's, there's a panic or there's, you feel your world's falling apart, all that is, really, is an opportunity to be convinced by the Spirit. Nothing's really going wrong. Nothing ever is going wrong. Either it's all just opportunities for this convincing. And from what, um, what was shared this morning, what Francis was sharing about the, the, the fear that can arise, um, and what Kirsten was sharing too about the meaninglessness that, you know, he, in this world we have, you know, these Freddy Krueger movies and all this stuff about Friday the 13th. Uh, it's all this horror stuff around Friday the 13th. Well, Jesus has his own 13th. It's lesson number 13. He drops his atomic bomb out of 365 lessons. He drops his atomic bomb on the ego in lesson number 13. Ooh. <laughs> Jesus is 13th. The ego makes up its own scary 13th, Friday the 13th. The ego, Jesus is like, all right, I'll, I'll drop the bomb on you on the 13th. You'll remember that one. You'll remember that lesson. A meaningless world engenders fear. Do you know it's the first lesson in the workbook where Jesus decides to make a direct cause and effect relationship? between fear and what's, what's causing the fear. It's the first lesson in the workbook where he, boom, he lays it out. He, he gives you a direct cause-effect relationship with fear. He says it's not a violent world, it's not a chaotic world that engenders fear. It's not what you perceive on the surface of consciousness. You know, that a world of scarcity or lack. That, none of that engenders fear. It's actually a meaningless world that engenders fear. There's nothing that the ego is more afraid of than meaninglessness. More, nothing is, is more frightening to it than meaninglessness. If you want to really scoot, scoot the ego out of its hiding place, like it's a little spider in the well, and you want to shine a light down there, a big light, and the little spider moves around to try to get away from the light. It's, it's afraid of meaninglessness, and that's because when the slate is clean, when you start to let go of the meanings of the world, you'll see that the Spirit will come rushing in to give a new meaning to the world. That's what the retranslation is. The Holy Spirit will give a brand new meaning to the whole world. It's a beautiful meaning. It's, it's the real world. It's the happy dream. It's the correction. And the ego doesn't want that to happen, so whenever there's a sense of meaninglessness, the ego tries to th 
thrust and throw meaning where there is none. It's trying to tell you, be afraid, watch out. You know, all its fear tactics come when you start to let go of thinking there's a meaning in the world. So when, if, that's what I heard today in some of the groups after that movie last night, that there was meaninglessness coming up, intense meaninglessness, that's actually, you're getting closer to the release point, because the ego really gets stirred up by meaninglessness. Now let's just follow lesson 13 down. Jesus is Friday the 13th for the ego, ooh. It, it's a meaningless world engenders fear, and then if you read down in the lesson, he, he drops the atomic bomb, always down in the lesson, where he makes his first cause-effect connection, and the ego doesn't like it, and it doesn't want to hear it, and it's like a major bomb. A meaningless world engenders fear, because I think I am in competition with God. Oh, oh, why have those words never been written on the planet before? Oh, oh, the ego is like a little spider. It's been caught. That's where the fear is coming in. That's where the rage comes up. That's where the, all the shame and the pain and the guilt come in. A meaningless world engenders fear because I think I'm in competition with God. And Jesus even says, you know, you know, you you may not believe this, you may be you, you may be uncomfortable with this. He he even follows it up like, listen, if you're stirred up by what I just dropped, it's yeah, it's to be expected. Uh, I've just dropped a big one. And I've just laid out the first direct cause and effect relationship in this workbook. The reason you're fearful is because you believe you're in competition with God. He's taking what he did in the text, talking about the authority problem, and he's saying, oh no, it's not about authority figures. Parents, judges, police officers, military officers, generals, those aren't, those aren't the authority figures you're afraid of. It's a question in your own mind of holding on to this authorship thing where the ego wants to be right about inventing itself and inventing the world. And God created you as spirit, and God creates only in spirit. And so when you try to invent apart from the way God creates, you believe you are in competition with God. So, when we watch a deep movie like that, and a very deep sense of meaningless comes up, and you watch your mind go like this, whoa, ah, heebie deebie deebie, heebie jeebie, heebie jeebie, you're getting all stirred up from that movie, it's because the meaninglessness is getting stirred up, and it's because all the distractions for a moment stop, and all this chasing idols stop, and you just come down to this point, and you face the utter, I'll be Krishnamurti for a moment, the utter, utter, fear of meaninglessness. Then you're close, you're getting close to healing. You're actually right on the verge of healing. If you can do like when Kirsten said, just let it move through. Don't try to defend against it, don't try to distract away, don't try to move away from it or anything like this. Let it move through, stay there with the Holy Spirit, <laughs> let, the, let those clouds move, because then the Holy Spirit can give you a new meaning for the entire cosmos. But not until you are willing to let this old thing pass away pass through, move through you. This is where atonement just seems scary because the ego is saying, you're going to be struck dead, God's going to punish you. It's used all of its crazy threats, you know, to say, don't stand there. And some of you have heard this from other teachers, you know, like Gangaji. Has anybody heard of Gangaji? Well, she'll just say, Gangaji? G-A-N-G-A-N-G-A-N-G-A-N-G-A-N-G-A-N-G-A-N-G-A-N-G-A-N-G-A-N-G-A-N-G-A-N-G-A-N-G-A-N-G-A-N-G-A-
A G J A, A J I <laughs> can't spell A J I. She Gangaji. One of her her favorite teaching is stop. <laughs> Gangaji's that stop moment that she's talking about is the moment I'm talking about when when that fear that sense of meaninglessness comes up and and the ego wants to rush in with distractions, rush in with justifications, rush in with intellectual ideas, rush in with something, <laughs> anything. <laughs> Busy yourself, you know, like Mary and Martha's story in the Bible, you know, where Jesus is teaching and Martha is so anxious about him teaching, she's got to run into the kitchen and spend all the time co cooking in the kitchen while Jesus is teaching, because it's too, <laughs> too much anxiety there. So, and Mary sits there. At, at his feet, listening. She's in the stop. She's in the Gangaji stop. Yeah, and another another reason that the ego used another um, defense mechanism the ego used to stop the, the energy from flowing through and be released is to conclude of what I am afraid of. I am afraid of losing this. I'm afraid <coughs> of losing that. I'm afraid of. Being alone, I'm afraid. It's like using this so that you will start to solve and start to engage your mi your mind in a specific situation or in a specific direction instead of just be there and be open and allow the new meaning to come in. The fact is, as what we're talking about today, is whatever you are afraid of is not something you can understand. It's something so pushed away from your awareness you are afraid of losing the meaning of this world. You're not really afraid of losing anything in this world. You're not really afraid of any of the human conditions that we talk about, being alone, being not taken care of. It's not the real reason that you're afraid of. But every time when this intensity comes up, boom, there is a temptation to just conclude, this is my emotion, this is the reason, this is where I'm at. Then. How do I find a solution? And you can see that there's just no solution that can be found there. The only the only thing we can do is please remove the conclusions. Just to be able to say, I don't know what I'm afraid of. And I don't even know that what it, this is. Sometimes it's agitation, so it could be some super sensitivity coming up around certain things. But just knowing that when this kind of shift happening happens, it happens at a very, very deep unconscious level. So it flush up a lot of things that doesn't even make sense to the logical mind. It doesn't make sense why you suddenly get agitated around certain things and this emotion bubbling up. And just the, the, the allowance to allow it to just be whatever it is and allow the Holy Spirit to tell me where they are instead of using the past story and the past experience to say this is what I'm feeling and I need to fix it right now. That's how the ego wants to stop, stop the opening to continue, you know. Yeah. But that's, that's very, very profound. If you just pause for a moment and take that in. It's, it's kind of a version of lesson number five. I'm never upset for the reason I think. That, that applies as well, when you come to that sense of deep fear and you, you know, you, you're trying to come up with a reason for it and find a solution, like a worldly solution to it. Including a direction for the spiritual journey from this point. Okay, well if the world's meaningless then, okay, perhaps my spiritual journey can look like this. And it's still trying to like grab hold of an idea, or even a spiritual idea and move forward with it, but it's just daring to stay so present with what is coming up in awareness now, because only the spirit can guide the mind through this awakening. It's like the very mind is experiencing this as being completely undone. So how can that mind know what's helpful or what it's going to look like? So it has to come from the spirit, it has to be revealed. And I think the, the question can rise, well, what's, what is the solution then? I mean, if, if that's the, if that cause-effect relationship has been so pushed out of awareness that a meaningless world engenders fear, 
because I think I'm in competition with God. If that is so horrifying, and that's pushed so far out of awareness, then what's the solution? True empathy is the solution. Uh, Jesus does a lot of teachings in the Course on True Empathy, and that's what I was saying earlier when my friend was saying, you know, the deeper you go in uh, unveiling and exposing the ego, it could seem like a nosedive, like a plane going down in a nosedive. But don't go into a tailspin with it. <laughs> the ego wants you to crash. You know, for me, true empathy pulls you, pulls you up and out, like an acrobatic flyer of Snoopy and the Red Baron. Pulls you out of it, pulls you up and out of it. And what is true empathy but, but your own certainty of what is real and true? I mean certainty. I mean real certainty. There was a teacher back at the turn of the century, um, back in the 1900s, some of you have heard of the founder of Christian Science, Mary Baker Eddy. Mary Baker, Mary Baker Eddy had a metaphysical college in Boston. And one day she was teaching and the glory of the Lord was pouring through her with all of her students. And it was pouring through her and pouring through her and she was in her glory and her magnitude teaching the glory of Christ, the invulnerability of Christ. And she made one statement and most of the students in her class got up and walked out. <laughs> they walked out on her. <coughs> In all of her glory, they walked out, they were like... And what was it that she said that caused most of the students in her class to walk out of the class? There's no mind in matter. No, that came in, in her book. There's no mind in matter, no life, truth. No, she just said three words in her glory that caused seemingly the, the whole place to vac evacuate. She said, I am infallible. Whoa! What does that mean? I am beyond mistake. And they walked out of the room. They couldn't handle it. You can't handle the truth, Jack Nicholas, Nicholson would say. You can't handle the truth. Her students walked out when she said, I am infallible. Now, if you know anything about Mary Baker Reddy, she was involved in a lot of healing the sick uh, because of her teachings were so spectacularly accurate and the presence of love was so strong. But that sentence, the students, hmm. <laughs> I remember there was a time I was at the Peace House and one of the students I'd worked with the longest and probably one of the most I spent the most time with, so to speak, in the dream. I remember I, I answered the phone one day and it was her screaming at the other end of the line. She, I answered the phone and I said, hello. And she goes, I'm in hell. I'm in hell. I'm dying here. I'm in hell. This went on for a couple minutes. It's just, it was, She's probably doing lesson 13 or something. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, she was just like, I'm in hell. It's been on for like two minutes. Screaming. As I pick up the phone, I'm just having a great day. It's a beautiful day and birds are chirping. This is what I'm greeted with. And so I listen for like two minutes and finally, after like a couple minutes, it stops. And it was like, help me, help me, it was pleading, help me, help me, help me, help me. Well, after two minutes, it stops and I absolutely burst into laughter. <laughs> I mean burst into laughter. This is what we call true empathy. This is what we call true empathy. After you get screamed at for two minutes with I'm in hell, and then you burst, you can't hold it back. You just, Burst into laughter. So I burst into laughter and I howled laughing. I don't even know how long I howled laughing. I just laughed and laughed and laughed and laughed. And then finally when the laughter stopped, this calm voice from the other end of the line said, Okay, <laughs> what did you do when you were in hell? <laughs> you see how, how the teacher-student relationship works? True empathy. Some of you have seen Way of the Peaceful Warrior. With Dan Millman, great movie. 
because Socrates is really in true empathy, and Dan isn't. Dan is like kicking. There's one time he, Dan Millman said he would go and, and Socrates said meet meet at the bridge on this campus over near Berkeley or whatever. You probably remember the scene and. And he got, he's so distracted about all these other things in his classes that he he shows up late to see to meet the teacher. And the teacher, when he finally reaches Socrates on the bridge, Socrates picks him up and throws him in the river. Because he's and and then he's angry. Then his rage comes up <laughs> as he gets out. You know, he's so upset. But the whole teaching was that he's not really present. And then just a touch from Socrates kind of sends him into this mystical state of mind to kind of show him then what the presence. These are great teaching devices. So with my friend, basically, I told her a parable of a time when, when I had a, an ego fit going on and I was basically saying, I'm not moving. I sat in the chair actually and I said to the ego, I'm not leaving this chair until you leave my mind alone. I've got nothing to do, I've got nowhere to go, I, I, I am sustained by the love of God, I am not moving. And so, she was, okay, bye. You know, that was, you know, <laughs> but these are the kind of exchanges. And, and this is what we mean by true empathy, is stay in your truth, stay in the certainty of your creation by, a, by an eternal source, by a loving source. So many temptations arise during the day to play little, to not be in truth, to not be in love, to, to succumb to temptation and believe you have to play small. Like for example, compromise. Most people I meet think that compromise is, is a good thing. You know, they feel like that's all there is, is you have to compromise with, at work, You've got to compromise in all your relationships, compromise with your children, compromise with your parents. This is one big game of compromise. And what does Jesus say about compromise in the Course in Miracles? He says, salvation is no compromise of any kind. He's given you the truth. Listen, if you're compromising, you're not saved. And by saved I mean salvation of your mind. You're not, you're not at peace if you're playing the game of bargaining and compromise. So that's why you need the Holy Spirit to take you into that certainty where you don't compromise anymore. Imagine how much fun you'd have in your life, how much absolute joy and fun you would have if you didn't make any compromises of any kind. And isn't that what the Bible taught? Let your yea be yea, let your nay be nay. There's nothing better. Yes is no better than no. Sometimes we, we even buy into that trick of thinking that yes is a better word than no. <laughs> but what, what have we learned? Sometimes the Spirit will say no through you, and sometimes it will say yes, and you'll feel peaceful when you let the Spirit speak it through you, whether it's a yes or a no. Because why? Because that's no compromise of any kind. You're not bargaining, you're not saying, okay, maybe, and we'll do it your way this time, but next time it's mine. <laughs> You know, that's not going to cut, cut it. You're not going to make it back into the Kingdom of Heaven trying to play the game of compromise. So these are good examples, really, not only of, of don't distract away from it when the feeling comes up, but be willing to, to go into a place of guidance and trust where you can actually connect mm -hmm. with the presence of love, which is not into compromise at all, doesn't even know what it is. Yeah, it's using everything as a positive affirmation for the truth. Using everything as a reason to turn to the Spirit. So whatever is going on is the opportunity to turn. That's it, it's like a decision to wake up. That's why we keep talking about it. It's, 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 it's a total decision and it's now. And it's the decision to wake up. It's the decision to know that Everything that happens to me, everything, every moment of every day, is here to serve my awakening. It's to help me see where my mind is at, what do I believe, what am I perceiving, and, to, and that's it. It's like every moment is so obvious what's going on in consciousness. 
And then the decision what to do with it is the decision to turn to spirit in every moment. Yeah, I just love how it's just very simple. Mm-hmm. It's just shifting cause and effect from something's playing out and I have to in the world to, oh, I have to remember the reference point, where I want to be guided from. Such a high teaching too. I mean, when we think of it for a moment, we may think, "Wow, I would love to live a life without compromise." But it seems like there's so much going on. Like that's like a real high goal. But remember, you don't have to figure out the way to do it. Even. All you have to do is want it, and the Holy Spirit will come rushing in with many, many, many opportunities to teach you true empathy. I mean, you'll just be given a boatload full of opportunities. As soon as you say, I will not compromise anymore. I'm going to trust you, God. I'm going to listen to you. I'm going to go for it. And I really want it. I want the peace of God. Not just the words, but I really want the experience. Then you get experiences. And it's absolutely hilarious how it happens. I remember all these parables of David. There was a time when I was at my little peace house and I was really enjoying this true empathy thing and thinking, this is really great. I just want nothing but this true empathy. And I put up a few different um, flyers around different places saying I had some space, you know, if anybody wanted to come and be a roommate. And oh wow, did I get a roommate. I, the Holy Spirit said, you want true empathy? I'll give you the roommate that will make sure, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that you are in true empathy. Some of you might have seen the sitcom Seinfeld. Anybody ever see Seinfeld? Very funny, Jerry Seinfeld and everything. There's a character on there named Kramer. I got the female version of Kramer answered my ad to be a roommate at my peace house. Her hair was sticking up in the air like Kramer's and Seemingly to the world, she was so um, impulsive and she had lived as part of the circus where, you know, it would be like if you didn't have any boundaries and you, I, I'm trying to think of a character that would be good. Did anybody ever see the movie, What About Bob? Yeah. That's one with Bill Murray. Where Bob is in, I need, I need, I want, I want, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. You know, it was just great. The hair and everything. She came into my life and it was so good because she made thousands of requests uh, every week. Can you take me here? Can you run me here? Can you do this? Can I have this? Can I do this? Can I do this? You know, it was just, it was like non-stop. And I was really in this kind of beautiful, devoted, mystical place. And so, you know, I was kind of beyond the early stage of the course. If someone makes an outrageous request, do it. You know, this, I've done all that years ago and everything. I'm kind of in this deep mystical place. In she comes. You did. Can you help me with this? You did. Can you get me right? You just, you it was just like all day. And it was so fun for me to just be in the flow and the joy of spirit. I'd go, no. No, 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 no. It was just the most fun. I had never had an opportunity to say no so many times. It feels so wonderful. Think about how guilty you feel sometimes when you say no. Just one no. Right? You know, you go, you go away. Ooh, they're not going to like me. You know, you know, all this stuff goes on. It was, she gave me the opportunity to actually say to her, listen, if you've got an issue going on in your mind, where you want to join minds, and you need a prayer partner, you want to talk about it or whatever, you can actually get me up in the middle of the night. Wake me up if you have an emotional, psychological call for help, where you want to join with a, with a mighty companion. I'm there for you 24-7. But, <laughs> with all these other request. It was just a beautiful opportunity for me to say, no, 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 It's like a machine gun. No, 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 no. Come to the door. No, 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 no. It was because they were just all 
real imp kind of meaningless request. And you know, we developed the most wonderful love and connection. She just, she advanced in her mind training so much. She ended up watching all these metaphysical movies with me and growing and maturing and getting more still and learning how to meditate. She would even be able to go and, and have an issue and go and pick out of my giant metaphysical movie collection. She would, on her own, she could go and pick out the very movies. The Spirit was speaking to her. All those no's worked such a wonder that she tuned in to the Spirit and let go of this distracting gimme, gimme, gimme voice where she could receive answers. She could hear the Holy Spirit. Before when she first arrived she was so scattered she, she you know, it was like obsessive compulsive distractions. But it was great and I, that's what I mean, it was great practice for true empathy. You, we need, whatever we need will be provided, that was given. Yeah, and it's really an experience to, to see that the more we practice that, the more we see it is the only thing that is truly helpful for anyone is that I am staying true empathy. You know, we talked about that on the car back home, that um, after the movie, there was a discussion on a ride back saying, you know, so I don't really have to worry about what, which school is the most helpful for my son's spiritual development or his awakening. No, it, it's not, because the problem, you know, is not outside, our soul, responsibility is our own awakening and atonement. Every time we try to solve a problem out there or take care of other people, we're saying, there is a world outside of me and everything outside of me needs to change except my mind. Basically, that's what I'm reinforcing every time I'm trying to help. So what is really going on is every time I'm doing it, I am reinforcing who I am in my mind, which is not true. So I am not reinforcing the truth in my own mind. Then the <coughs> ego projection and the perception gonna keep perpetuate itself to reflect back my false belief because I never stay in this training to train my own mind to, to see the truth because I always want to see there's something out there that's wrong and they need to change instead of the way I see them. So that's why the true empathy is so important. It's not about anyone else. It's about the, the filter that we see through everything. We have to use that, all the opportunities that present during the day and during our life to, to say this is <coughs> my mind and I am gonna bring it back to ask what is truly helpful if it is my mind and then allow the actions to be guided that's not the focus. The, the action, the form, how to behave is not the focus, but it's always the thinking. Do I try to get out there? Which one should do which? Which one should do which? And that is the wrong, the wrong direction already there. You know, that's why the, the whole basis of the true empathy is is key for our awakening. And true empathy will solve it all for you. It will solve this feeling of fear around meaninglessness, but what's the, what's the most tricky, devious weapon that the ego has to guard against the Kingdom of Heaven? Well, actually in the Course, in the text, Jesus says, you're almost home. You've almost made it back to Heaven. You just have one obstacle in front of you. And all you have to do is transcend this one obstacle and you're home free you've made it home to heaven. Special love relationship. Special love relationship. The belief that you can, can have a relationship that's different from the relationship that God created you in, which is spirit, pure spirit. And so this world is an attempt to experiment with coming up with a relationship different than the relationship that we have with the Creator. Now, that's going to be one. We had fun talking about that a little bit on the way. Meta was taking me home yesterday, and, or picking me up yesterday, and we had a nice talk in the car today because um, a, a, a woman wrote to me, and it was beautiful. She's just immersing in all of our teachings and all of our materials and immersing in the Course and everything. And at the bottom of her beautiful, beautiful email 
was it like a little PS? Oh, I, it's something to the effect of I, I've really been able to, uh, I have something to extend because I've, I have something to extend in terms of undoing special relationships. And she put in there, I've just, I've actually gone through an eight year open relationship. Eight year open relationship. Most of us have an idea, whatever our ideas are of open relationship, but they're not our traditional boxes that we have for relationships. Whatever those boxes are. And, and I thought, hmm, we were talking that, that would really, talk about pushing your buttons. <coughs> the ego is heavy laden with expectations around relationships. If you don't think so, try it out <laughs> and notice how strong and how intense it is. But this, really when you look at it, what is a, a relationship, an earthly relationship for, except what? To experience true empathy. If you've got to let your yay be yay and your nay be nay and you have a partner, what an opportunity that is. Isn't that a ride? Isn't that the, the adventure of a lifetime? While you still believe in that subject-object split, you're going to have an enormous amount of mirroring that will go on because whatever in you believes that you can have a will of your own is going to come up for the healing in that, that mirroring. Now we're not advocating anything one way or another in terms of form, what we are advocating is, is everything properly perceived is an opportunity to teach and learn true empathy. That we can wholeheartedly back. <laughs> because that's your freedom. That's your freedom from fear. And anything that comes up in the context of you feeling like that's not, that's just not right. We would say, yeah, that's just not right-minded. <laughs> it's not that there are forms that are right or wrong. It's just that when you have a belief that you can have a separate will apart from the Creator, you'll get lots of opportunities to teach and learn true empathy. It's before our, our lunch break. You want to open it up to clarifications, questions? So you say uh, a relationship is good or Highly recommend it. I call that, that's the fast track. <laughs> it's not a fast track. You got, over here you've got rugs, and then you've got <laughs> different kinds of things, but, but that's, that's amazing when you combine your spirituality with allowing your spirituality to be used with a relationship context. That's, I mean, when, when I, was talking with Jesus, I would ask Jesus, what's the fastest way back to heaven? And give it to me straight. And Jesus said, there's two things. One is silence, and one is relationship. And the best is both of them. <laughs> I mean, if you're in a relationship and you start meditating, oh man, all the shit, all the, everything is going to come up. You know how that, when you start to meditate for long periods of time, you get down like the rotor rooter, you get down, 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 more to the root. And then when you, just when you get in touch with it, if you're in a relationship, oh man, there's a mirroring that's going on. 
anything that you couldn't hit with your silence and medication practice, meditation practice, medication almost. <laughs> your, anything that you couldn't avoid with your medication yeah, practice, yeah. you couldn't hit with your meditation practice. Oh, if you've got the relationship thing going, you've got the, the mirror in your face. So, Jesus said, yeah, <coughs> silence, the practice of stillness, and relationship is the fast track back to heaven. I just, you know, I just broke up with my girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> is, that, is that a kind of a trying to uh, escape for the mirror? Mm -hmm. Well, these things with breakups, they, again, it all comes down to the purpose. Um, it, you can't conclude that the breakup was was just purely an avoidance um, tactic, in the sense that if it could be that you're kind of on the cusp of, of really opening up in amazing ways, and the Spirit is made space for you to be here right now uh, with that breakup, to be participating in all of this, and then also if you are in that place of just openness to the universe, open to Spirit, saying, whatever helps, whatever would be most helpful. Um, you don't have to like seek for it, it just, just from the prayer of your heart, saying, please, whatever is most helpful, it will come uh, really directly to you. And then you have the presence of mind to be in that, oh, this is, this is an answer to my prayer. I'm going to let the Spirit use whatever the circumstances are, whatever the situation, whatever the relationship, I'm going to let the Spirit use it for cleaning, for purifying my heart, for letting me love even deeper. We've talked about that love you feel for the planet. That love just growing deeper and deeper and more fulfilling than ever through this, this journey. So I wouldn't conclude anything about that. I think it can be even a spaciousness for you to kind of drink this in a bit. And, you know, that that feels like that's actually what's happening right now. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, A Course in Miracles is really a, a tool that uses relationships. Like all the way through it, he's saying, you and your brother, you and your brother. And it's a metaphor, because in the end, that, that you and your brother dissolves, when you really see, wow, it is all my own mind, and it always has been. But there's some great lines in there where Jesus is talking about relationships. And there's one where he says, every relationship is a total commitment. Every relationship. And he describes these different relationships. And one is like holy encounters, where you have a brief connection with someone. It can be as brief as you meet in an elevator. And the way you connect with someone if you catch eye contact, it's an opportunity for a total commitment. No different to a relationship where it could be more of a partnership where you end up living together and you're together for months or years. It's a total commitment. And then the third level of relationships he describes where there can be a hostility towards each other and it may last for a whole lifetime. But the two with this hostile grievance underneath the relationship, he says, like if if that teaching learning could, could be healed, if that, that ancient hatred finally became forgiven within that relationship, you know, that would be it. It would become the holiest place on earth. And yeah, each of these relationships, whether they're a brief encounter or a lifelong encounter, <laughs> um, they're all a total commitment because the mind is, is, when you're turning to the spirit and using everything, it's this total commitment really is in this relationship with the spirit. And it's in seeing that every encounter that I have with you, whether it's in person or even in my mind, how I think of you is how I think of myself. How I see you is how I see myself. Mm. How I remember you is how I remember myself. He says, never forget this. Because in your brother you will find yourself or lose yourself. 
So we're using every relationship, every thought we have of our brother is our opportunity for forgiveness of how we truly see ourselves. It's, it's pulling back the projection to, oh, this is my mind, these are my thoughts. And this is the healing of the, the relationship. Everything fully in awareness is is what forgiveness is. That means there's nothing hidden. You see, awareness, when you're aware, it's not hidden. But the subconscious mind is the attempt to hide secrets, private thoughts, to maintain something that's a that's not of God. And so that's beautiful. It, it's a beautiful way of using that word, just to let everything be fully conscious or fully aware. And then there's nothing. Yes, yeah, so, so really it's, it's a good thing when there's darkness in the awareness because then the darkness is in the light and it's being healed or, or released. Yeah, it's like, it's, I think it's a helpful, it's a helpful to have full allowance and permission. And in the end, there's a transcendence in which darkness and light don't meet. It's yeah. just light, but, but you do have to let the darkness, yeah, come come up to the light. That's very, very helpful. Yeah, because there isn't uh, endless amounts of darkness, so... Oh, it ends. But yeah. We, but <laughs> Sooner or later, <laughs> it, seems it, that will, way it, will be, it will be finished. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure what my question is, really, but um, I can share what has been going on, uh, what's been going on in my life lately. Um, and it's been this seeming breakup uh, with a boyfriend and he's like, he's reflecting to me that I've, maybe I've left him three, four times now and it's been this kind of maybe, but there's still some love, so we need and I don't want to put a form on it and so he's giving me a lot of, um, he's actually saying like, you hurt me or you're using me like a toy, which has been like, oh my you know, that's been a tough one to swallow. Um, so I feel that whenever I just um, go with what feels natural and try not to people please and not to say, you know, um, come over as much as you want if it doesn't feel right to me. And then sometimes I have the opening and I, I think of him and invite him over. So he feels like he's just being, you know, like a feather in the wind, I think, um, that I'm somehow, um, yeah, affecting him, affecting him. Um, and it's been kind of chaotic and frustrating um, and I feel like lately it's like the words just don't, I, I can't use the words anymore. So in the relationship for me it's more just a feeling underneath it all and he's very much wanting answers all the time and he has so many wives and I can, it's like when he starts with the wives it's just blank. I, I just feel like nothing to say. And sometimes I can see myself really wanting somehow to save him or to give him something uh, so he can have some relief. And then I, I, I can kind of observe myself saying something and at the same time feeling, do I really believe this or why am I actually doing this? So, and it's just like this loop going on and on uh, with, with them getting together and he feels like, he, like it feels like now he's, he feels safe and now we're together. Like, or there's some form and then I can feel I want to, no, 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 that's not it. <laughs> so it's all the time this coming together, breaking apart thing and it's kind of frustrating and, and he's actually, it feels like some, somehow he's pushing me to say, this is it, no more, you know. Um, but it's just been weird seeing this, yes, no, maybe, I don't know, and the guilt coming up with that kind of game going on and on. Yeah. yeah. No, it's, I think it's beautiful that you're you're in touch with all that because um, I saw on your Facebook page it was like life coach, 
And this is life, this is eternal life coaching through you now, and coaching yourself. It's very spontaneous, the structure starts to fall away, which in interpersonal relationships to the ego, the structure is very important. The form is very important to it. It's not interested in content. It's not interested in, in the Beatitudes and the joy consistently. It, it, wants, it has a very, very, very strong investment in the form. And, and that's an investment in time too. It's, it's something Meta and I were talking about in the sense that once, you know, there are temporary commitments and those have served uh, well, but then you start to move more towards the holy instant. In this sense of let your yay be yay, your nay be nay, being able to just say, I feel this now, and not have to answer all the why questions. It's almost like giving yourself more and more permission to be the life coach, the eternal life coach. Like you're teaching what you would learn, you're, you're strengthening it. And the ego gets flushed up because it says, you can't live that way. The ego says, you can't live without structure. You know, it's saying, that's ridiculous. You know, you have to compromise. And what we talked about earlier is, is being willing to not compromise your purpose of your life coach, just even that itself is, is a commitment. You're making a higher commitment to that and then letting all things be used. So maybe, maybe after lunch, because we're, we're right about getting close to that time, probably our food will be here in like six or seven minutes, but that's when I like to talk about this topic of holy relationship because the Course spends like nine chapters on going from specialness to holy. And we've talked a bit today about, about unholy relationships, or we've talked about specialness, but there's a whole, a whole field of reflections of what holiness is. Because holiness comes from following your purpose. When you are uncompromising and you follow your purpose, you draw forth witnesses and reflections of that purpose. So in my life, for example, it's gone from having more typical interpersonal relationships along the way. Each one was like an opening, more opening, more healing, serve, serve. There's a commitment level with all of those. And then you go into this purpose where you really dedicate yourself to true healing in the mind. And then I found that these collaborative witnesses come along and uh, it's like you were just saying about, you said, I have to have a boyfriend now who is into taking full 100% responsibility. That's just a symbol of your commitment to the truth. Like saying, I'm not interested <laughs> in that. Ultimately everything is a mirror, but, but that's just a symbol. If you have somebody that comes into your life and says, wow, I agree with you. Let's use the relationship for taking 100% total responsibility for our state of mind. Mm -hmm. You know, for some of us that actually does come along. It's, it's not a common thing where you need a partner that goes, yeah, I'm not interested in all these other things, I've been through all those, but I am interested in taking full responsibility for my state of mind. And I want you to remind me of it when I forget, and I'll remind you, you see how high that is. It's a much higher relationship. It's, it's a much higher level of commitment than ever before. So I feel like that's something that we can talk about um, after lunch. We can continue on with that. Uh, I know you kind of pick up your son in the afternoon, but we can have a, t a little bit of a time frame there because what i found is, I find these vibrational connections, I find those showing up in my awareness where we rejoice together in sharing this high purpose and our focus is so strong in that, that, that they're very joyful relationships. They're really joyful reflections. Mm -hmm. And they're nothing like anything that came before. You know, it's like a whole new quantum leap, a quantum shift, saying, okay, I'm giving up a lot of my horizontal expectations for this because this is what I really want in my heart. And then um, I find that they're very collaborative. We come together where there's not 
um, there's not even like time expectations. We, if we agree to meet, we will, if one of us has something that comes up, we'll communicate. Say, oh, this came up and this and this, but we don't hold each other to time. We, we, we are here to extend love, but we're not here to hold each other to time. We're not here to question each other's motives. This stuff about why, 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 that's, that's how the ego operates. Why did you do this? Why did you do that? <laughs> Help me understand you. I can't understand you. Tell me why. I'm going to leave. Ultimatums. I'm leaving. I'm out of here. I you, heard that yesterday. He yeah. said, like, I, I was close to calling and saying, have a nice life, because I can't take it anymore. And I said, so why didn't you do it? <laughs> and, you know, it's like, and then, then again, he was into the victimization, and, but why, and why do you use me like a toy? And you just see that I kind of, I was very close to reaching this feeling of, is this, you know, is this spirit telling me, this is time to just say, let it go. Because I'm actually doing it to myself all the time. I was asking myself, why, why do you pick up the phone, the phone each time and, and, and play the role of the, the crazy girlfriend or ex-girlfriend or whatever I am? Why don't I just stop it? And I can see it's a part of the still wanting to, uh, things to end nicely and be friends and you know have the love there and have him maybe actually having him understand the way I see it, but I can't explain it. So yeah. maybe that's what I just need to, you know, maybe I don't know how to to make him understand and maybe it's just a trust thing <clears throat> that spirit will take over from here and it's not me personally having to explain explain him the course in a way he can understand it and so yeah it's yeah. beautiful this is like i it's just what we talked about about this is relationships for, for teaching true empathy and this is their big time if you're a life coach and to be in line with life is to have true empathy then you're doing it. In fact, we're giving Ocean a glimpse. He's ready for the girlfriend to show up. And you're giving a glimpse of, of how you must be to be in true empathy. You must have the worthiness. I mean, it's truly the worthiness thing. You know, if, if you come more and more into that alignment with purpose, you start to realize, I am worthy of love. I am love. I am worthy of love. I'm worthy of reflections of love. It's really capital self-love uh, in the truest sense. It's not narcissistic in any way. It's, it's really true empathy. And then there, the beauty of that is that then it's more like that lesson, let all things be exactly as they are. That's how I feel in these collaborative relationships where someone will say, hey, let's collaborate with this or let's do this. Uh, let's work on this or let's do this or let's do that and it's meant with it's you both feel you're both a reflection of the willingness to be used by spirit together and then when there's times when the bodies aren't together you still have the love there's it's still there it doesn't go away it doesn't need to always have the bodies together but that's basically how the ego has set up the construct of relationships, bodies together, minds apart. And then the Spirit's saying, no, mind together, mind unified on the same purpose is the whole key to happiness. And then the bodies will be where the bodies will be. There, there may be all kinds of configurations. I'm over here traveling now and this is the way the three of us are here and sometimes it's four, sometimes it's two, sometimes it's one. We've got our support teams here you've seen Michael Andy we're all like like a bunch of ants that are kind of moving around inspired by the love Andy must have been up last night to edit those speakers he must have been up at night just working away so we were here late doing a movie and then I looked and oh there's two speakers up I thought, oh, well, Andy's been working away. It's like the, the, we're like little busy ants that are all inspired by the same purpose. Mm -hmm.